God bless you, saints of the Most High God. Welcome to another Bible study. The Lord bless you richly. And of course, we thank you so much for joining in. It is important to be a part of Bible study. So much to learn, so much that we have to put together so that we can properly order our steps as we walk the walk in this Christian pathway. God bless you again, and we are going right into our study for this evening. Have you ever contemplated the statement that Jesus made in St. Matthew chapter 5 when he called his disciples and declared to them, said to them, that you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. So many folks are unaware of what exactly Jesus meant when he said those things to his disciples. Salt is crucial. Light is crucial. And he used those terms in illustrating, in describing them, so that you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. I believe that many of God's children are unaware of what he really meant when he said those things. And so we are going to take time and explore um, these statements of Jesus and put them into a kind of perspective so that we understand who the true child of God is. We are going to use as a theme for this Bible study series, uh, who is the true child of God, or simply the true child of God. Now, salt and light are ordinary things that uh, is used in everyday communication across cultures. And so, because there are things, there are items that are used across the world, across cultures, it makes them obvious candidates for Jesus to use as illustrations. And that is extremely important. I want us, over this Wednesday night and possibly into next Wednesday night, to look closely at the things that are associated with salt, the things that are associated with light, and put them together so that we can clearly understand who we are and what is expected of us as children of God. I submit to us that so many of us are unaware of who we really are, what we are supposed to be doing, the impact that we are supposed to be having on the people of this world. And so we are going to delve a little bit into this subject area, the true child of God. We use the term, I use the term true child of God to represent the real followers of Jesus Christ because there are so many that would indicate because they got saved at one point and so as far as they are concerned, that one experience, that experience of 20 years ago is sufficient for me to today still say I am a child of God. But we have to understand that the children of God, the true child of God, is not merely one who had an experience 5 or 10 or 20 years ago, but one who is living a certain way that they can conform to what Jesus said when he called them the salt of the earth, when he described them as being the light of the world. Are you the salt of the earth? Are you the light of the world? Because if not, we might be fooling ourselves into believing that today as we stand, we are children of God when in fact we are not. The very Bible tells us that it is not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, who shall be saved? But he that doeth the will of God. And it's an important concept that we grasp 
as children of God because if we miss it, sometimes we might be going in a particular way, going along a particular trajectory, unaware that the Spirit of the Lord has departed. We need to know who we are. We need to know what is required of us. We need to know where we stand. We need to understand the things that have been said about us, what it means, what we are to be doing, that we are not doing. And so make sure that we have things together and we are on the right path and our walk and our speech combine and synchronize. It is extremely, extremely important. So there is a scripture that we are going to start with. And we are going to read two scriptures from the book of St. Matthew chapter 5. And we are going to start our journey. We are going to take our time and we are going to examine salt, its characteristics. We are going to look at light, its characteristics. And we are going to drill down into some things. And we will examine ourselves to see if indeed we are the salt of the earth and if indeed we are the light of the world because if we look into what we are supposed to do and how we are supposed to live as salt and as light and we are not seeing that manifesting in our lives i dare say we have or will have a big problem so we are going to take our time and we are going to go through on this journey because at the end of the day, what is most important, beloved, is that we are a part of the Savior's bride. Anything else that is happening, if we miss this, we would have lost out. So we are not here just to talk and to go through the motion and to turn up at church and we want to make sure that if we are supposed to be salt we are salt because the bible says if the salt has lost its savor what use does it have and we want to make sure that even though we know that we were once salt we are still salt because salt can lose its savor we want to make sure if we are called light, and it means that we are supposed to be shining, we want to make sure that we are indeed shining. And so we're going to spend some time, and we're going to go through these things and make sure that we are clearing our minds. It's very important. And that we understand what is required of us as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So the true child of God is what we are going to be talking about and illustrating it with these metaphors that Jesus used to describe us. And I trust and hope that his description of us is such that when we examine our lives and when we look at ourselves, we fall into the category as the salt of the earth. We fall into the category as the light of the world. Or else, we are in a challenge. So let us join me as we look at the first slide. We're just going to look at some scriptures. And join me as we go through these scriptures and start drilling into this subject matter. Praise God. So we are starting with St. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13 and i want to also make this point and it is important that we understand um, the concept I, I said it earlier on that their ordinariness that salt and light and use in all cultures around the world make them obvious candidates for jesus to use as illustrations and i want us to understand that now Jesus loved using everyday items to communicate deep truths about God and about his people. And so his description of his disciples as salt and light, we well know. And as I said, do we really understand the truths he was bringing across to us? It's very, very important. I submit to us... Uh, I'm about to read the scripture. No, just, just hold a while. I submit to us that 
many of his disciples today who he identifies as salt of the earth and light of the world are not aware or are not fully aware, aware of what he really meant. And therefore, we want to make sure, we want to make sure that we are clearing our minds as we go through uh, the, this uh, series. No, St. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden on the foot of men. So that's verse 13. Now verse 14, we continue. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And so, having read those scriptures, we want to move and to go right into our discussion at, uh, on the subject. Now, if you're a child of God, living the surrendered life, I want to submit to you, saints of God, that you, your life matters. It is important. And we have to understand the important role we play and this literally is demonstrated in how we conduct ourselves. Now, salt of the earth, light of the world, these are significant because without salt, we understand that life is miserable and near impossible. And we will show why in a little while. And without light, we, we are clear that there will be no life. Really, there will be no life. Light allows for a number of things to take place. For those who have a science background, we know the process of photosynthesis, and we know that you know the, the, the trees and the flowers and so around us, they take in the carbon dioxide and they give out the oxygen, and all of this process happens and can only happen where there is light. And so without salt, things will spoil. Without salt, things will be bland in terms of their taste. Similarly, without light, there is no life. And these two significant items, salt and light, Jesus used to describe us as children of God, as his disciples, it means that we are vital. It means that we are crucial. We are necessary in this world. Without salt, things will perish. Without light, there will be no life. And it is as simple as that. And these two critical components to life are the things that he has used to describe us as, as children of God as the true child or children of God as his disciples. And so I want to know, having said that, go back a little bit and we won't read it, but I want us to make a note of it and to read St. Matthew chapter 5, starting from verse 3, going down to verse 12. And of course, we picked up from 13 and 14 that tells us about salt and light. But if we go back a little bit in the chapter from about verse 3, we will realize that Jesus was sitting on the mount. And everybody in church, this church uh, community knows this as what is called the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus started to talk to the disciples and to those that were gathered there. And he started to explain to them, blessed are the, 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 pure, the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed, blessed are, and it goes on and on. 
And on that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was relating. He had about eight things that he spoke to um, directly while he was there on the Mount with the disciples. Right? We call it, uh, we call it as we have here, the Beatitudes. And what Jesus was essentially pointing out, that blessed are the pure, blessed are the meek, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, all there are about eight of them that he outlined there. And it was essentially showing how the kind of mannerism, the kind of thing that should characterize the life of a child of God. He took the time out to outline these things so that we can understand that this is the way of life of those who say they are my disciples. And these eight things that he described, we refer to it as the, the Beatitudes. These eight things, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn, right? The poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it goes on. All of these things, which in Christendom we call the Beatitudes, represents the mannerism, the way of life of the true child of God. The beatitude, just for information, is a Latin word, beatus, and it simply means happy or fortunate. So what Jesus was saying when he said, blessed are the pure in spirit, he was saying, happy, fortunate are the pure in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Happy are those that are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Happy are they that mourn. So you might be mourning now, but you will be blessed. You will be happy. You are fortunate, for they shall be comforted. And it went on and went through a list of things, which I ask you to read later on. But these Beatitudes were very important. That Jesus spoke to them specifically. And so the fact that Jesus himself specifically pointed at these things that characterized the disciples, the life of the disciple, it was significant. And so the Beatitudes, they are important because one, Jesus specifically spoke these words and described the life, the mannerism of his disciples. It is important for the second reason. It provides insight into how we are meant to conduct ourselves as disciples of Jesus Christ. If you notice, if we go through, you know, he's asking us that we must be poor in spirit. Uh, blessed are they that mourn. Uh, blessed are the meek. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Uh, blessed are the merciful and the pure in heart and the peacemakers. It's really giving us an insight into how we are meant to act, to behave, to conduct ourselves. These people that demonstrate these qualities are the real people of God, the real disciples, the true children of God. And then thirdly, what they can expect in life, that is in this life and in the life to come. So Jesus utilized, used this forum on the mount, the Sermon on the Mount, to point out to his disciples how they ought to conduct themselves, what they ought to expect in this life, and what they ought to expect in the life to come. And he's saying that you are my disciples. So understand now, children of God, people of God, beloved, yes, we are saved. Yes, we had an experience with God. But then, now that we are saved and we are living, we need to understand some things.
things so that we can conduct ourselves in the right way. And so, it is important. Jesus, having said all of that, he now came down to point out some things. Having said all of that from St. Matthew 5, from 3 to 12, he then went over into verse 13, which says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And it is important that we understand that. Now, let us deal with salt. He says that we are the salt of the earth. Let us deal with that. Let us understand what he was saying when he called us, when he described us as salt, when he used salt as an illustration to say that we are the salt of the earth. Salt, we know, is very valuable or was very valuable in the ancient times. In fact, there are folks in the, the Grecian community that literally thought that salt contained something in it that made it divine. Salt was sought after. Salt was stored. Salt was seen as extremely valuable because of some of the things which we will discuss later on. It contains some of the things which it causes to happen, some of the things which it demonstrates as a part of what it is, salt itself. And the Greeks thought it, was, it had divine characteristics. Of course, you know, if you had a cut and you apply salt to it, uh, it's going to burn you, it's going to hurt you much, much more. That, that old saying, had salt to the wound. But what they knew is that although you're adding salt to the wound and it now burns you more, that salt had a medical property that it caused the whatever bacteria, whatever was there as a result of the cut that can make it become something much worse that can cause it to spread and cause a simple cut to become a, a major wound, a sore. If you apply salt to it, it does something to cauterize, to stop the spreading of germs and so bring about healing. So there is that healing uh, property that is in salt. And so these folks saw it as being divine. Something was mystic and mysterial, mysterious about the salt. Also, the Romans saw it as something very priceless. It was so priceless in the Roman times that the Romans would sometimes pay their soldiers with salt. Now, you would have heard a term, and I'm going to tell you how that term came about, because when those soldiers are paid in salt, and if they, for example, just as an example, would have gotten five pounds of salt for the week, for their wage, or a part of their wage, if they did not perform their functions well, if they did not live up to what they were asked to do by their superiors, if they were supposed to go 10 miles and they were able to only go six and they fell to the ground because of exhaustion and that kind of thing, at a certain point you would hear the saying that he was not worth his salt. That is where that term came from. They used to pay them in salt. And if, I, if you hear your superior say you're not worth your salt, it means you're getting the salt, the pay, but you're not doing that you're, what you're supposed to do. You're not living up to what you're being paid for. So salt it was a, something that was extremely, in, in the ancient world, valuable. They saw it as containing uh, divine spiritual properties. And the Romans used it to pay their soldiers just to show how valuable salt was. So that salt now had a number of purposes in the ancient world, at least five of them we have list listed here, and we want to go through them so that we can bring out some of these characteristics of salt. We see one, it was used for seasoning and flavoring, two, for preserving, three, for sacrificing, four, for destroying or stroke judgment, and five for fertilizing. Let us look at them one at a time as we extract some of the things that salt was used for. 
So, number one, seasoning or flavoring. Salt makes food, and we know, taste better. And it is important for us to know that. So it is used to provide flavoring to food, seasoning to food. Salts will make something that would otherwise be bland have a much better taste, a much better taste. And we all can attest to that. And so it is a powerful illustration of how we are to serve the world. It is a powerful illustration. We flavor this world that we are in. We literally, literally are seasoning in this world. When the Lord said that we are the salt of the earth, he has placed us in this world to bring a kind of a flavor. The world is bland. The world is, 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 is tasteless. And he has said that we are the salt. It means that we are here for a purpose. We are to make this world. We are to impact this world and make this world that we are in a better place. No, I'm not talking better in terms of the whole political system and a whole heap of the other things. We know that this world system is going down. But there are people in this world that make it up. And we are to season the place where these people are that they can see that something else is here that can make life worth living. And who or what? will season the place, will flavor the world so that folks may know that there is something better. It is us so that when he says that you are the salt of the earth, it means that we are to permeate this place, this space in which we live so that folks can know that something is better and we are the ones that he has designated to make this place better so that people can taste and see that the Lord is around. Taste and see that something is good, something is here that will make life worth living. Paul, in writing to the Colossians, he said, we are to spread throughout the world and to make a difference. Yes, so that it's our being here and the difference that we make is noticeable. And that is something that we ought to be aware. We are to spread out and we ought to make sure that our lives make a difference. We season, we season, we flavor this world so that we can know that we are making a difference. So that is point number one. Point number two, salt is a preservative. Salt preserves things. In fact, salt is said to be the ancient equivalent of a refrigeration. In the days of old, way back when, in the time when Jesus was here and made this statement, there was no refrigeration. Salt was what? Refrigeration. Salt was what they used to preserve food so that it stayed long. Salt was what they used to keep fish from spoiling and meat from decaying and all of that. This was the main reason why salt was so valuable. Its ability to preserve meat, to preserve fish, to preserve things. We are in this world as a preservative. And it is important that we understand that we are here as true children of God to keep it from total decay. And I want us to understand that we are here to make sure that so long as we are here, yes, the world is not getting better, but the, the, the system is going down. But there are people here who we must minister to, who we must reach out to. And this is the reason why Jesus said that we are salt, because one of the properties of salt is to preserve. And we are going to do what we must do. We have to do what we must do to preserve any sense of morality in this world as we know it today. And we have to make sure that we understand that and to do what must be done 
to keep it from total moral decay. decay. So we said in the first point that flavors, it seasons, but we are seeing in point number two that not only does it save us, which is giving flavor and which is seasoning, but it also preserves, saves. We are the folks, we as true children of God, by virtue of how we live, we are going to make sure that we can cause people to be saved, their lives to be preserved from the decay that is literally taking place in this world. Men need God. Men need a way to keep them from the moral and the other decadence that is taking place in the world. And we as the preservatives, when we apply to the lives of people around, they will be preserved, their lives will be preserved, and they will be saved. So Jesus knew that for this to happen, salt, and he used the illustration of salt, salt has to be applied to the particular thing, the meat and the fish and whatever, so that they are preserved. And he's saying, you are salt, and the thing has to be Preserved. The people have to be preserved. And I'm counting on you to make sure that that property of preservation is within you because people must be saved. I want to make sure that that property of seasoning and flavoring is in you because they must see that life is worth living. And we are the ones that he has called salt to make sure that they are placed in the pot of this world. The third property of salt, it is used, it allows for sacrifices to take place. We're not going to read Leviticus 2 ter verse 13, make a note of it, read it, but you're going to see that for the children of Israel, before they went to offer their sacrifice, they were told that they had to season that sacrifice, that carcass that we were going to put on the altar, it, had to, it was necessary that it be seasoned with salt. And the seasoning was to one aspect of it, but the other application was the preservation. So when they killed that animal, before it went to the altar, before it was offered as a sacrifice, it had to be rubbed down with salt, both for the flavoring and also for the preservation. And that part was necessary. You could not offer the sacrifice. You could not carry that carcass on the altar without it being salted. The salt was a part of the process. And so we are seeing that, we are seeing that even in our covenant with God, and this is where the term salt covenant came, because of the importance of salt, as part of the covenant with his people, there was a salt covenant that was made that showed that God worked with them. And as they offered the sacrifice uh, to him on the altar, it had to have salt rubbed all over it. It was a part of the covenant. And so salt and covenant goes together. We have a covenant with Almighty God. And he has, uh, we are salt. And so as we offer up our sacrifice, we being salt, our bodies are the living sacrifice, and we ought to make sure that as we offer up our praises and our sacrifices to God, we are indeed salt. Jesus said we are, but we must be very careful, beloved, that the salt that we are supposed to be, it has not lost its savor. We must be careful and take stock and take note that we are still salt, and the salt must go with the the, the, the caracas, the offering that is going on the altar. So if we are there offering up sacrifices of praise and our lives are not salted, these offerings are going up and they are going nowhere. The salt is a part of the offering. And we see it in Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 13. And yet over in the New Testament in St. Matthew, Jesus calls us the salt of the earth. We are salt. And it adds to our offering. And when we send it up to God, our lives which is supposed to be salted, and the offering that comes from our lips, 
comes together and is a sweet savor in the nostrils of Almighty God. So we're seeing salt as crucial, a critical part of our worship and praise. Our lives must be salted. A lot of folks are into worshiping and praising, so to speak. I put quotations there. And our lives are not demonstrating that we are salt. If the salt has lost its favor, our savor, if the salt has lost it, and we are there offering up sacrifices, we are doing it in a way that it is not supposed to be done. And those sacrifices might be vain sacrifices because the salt is not applied. So again, let us run through. One, salt is used for seasoning or flavoring. Two, salt is used for preserving. Three, salt is a part of the sacrificial offering. It was so in the Old Testament as we see in Leviticus 2 and 13. It is so in the New Testament because Matthew 5 verse 13 says you are the salt and salt and sacrifice goes together. It must be, the salt must be applied to the sacrifice before it goes on the altar and is offered up to God. Be very, very careful. Now the fourth one, there is something about salt that a lot of folks have not realized. You know, we never normally associate salt with judgment, but I want us to understand that. And, and Jesus said, we are salt, and so we are going to have some role to play as it relates to judgment, and we must be careful also that we who are supposed to be salt, seasoning the world, preserving the world, we have to be very careful that we have not lost our saltness, and so we are just a part of the world system with some verbal... Mani uh, manifestation that we are Christians. Salt in an ancient Near East was used to express judgment from evil or for evil. We note in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 26 that Lot's wife was, uh, became a pillar of salt. She looked back, her heart was in Sodom for whatever reason she looked back and Jesus used that in Luke 17 in describing the day of his coming where he was going to judge. He used that to say, be careful, remember Lot's wife. So we have to be, understand that salt, and she became a pillar of salt, judgment, destruction. And we are the salt of the earth. If we do salt this place, we might be responsible for people being destroyed, people being judged who really could have or should have made it, but because we were not doing what we were supposed to do in salting the earth to preserve it, in salting the earth to season it, yes, in ensuring that we have salt so we can offer our sacrifice of praise, we allowed judgment to come, which is coming, but folks who should have been inside is on the outside because our lives were not salted. We must be very careful. We notice again in terms of judging Moses warning the children of Israel what God was going to do and he was going to salt the land as part of the judgment that he would pour out upon them if they did not follow his words to the T. And that was judgment, that was destruction again. And salt was being used. So I want us to understand that there's something about salt that it has a destructive element to it. Gideon's son Amalek, uh, when he tried to become king and they ran him away and it didn't work out for him in his frustration and in his anger, he sowed the land with salt. Judges 9 tells us about that. And sowing the land with salt, it caused the land to be barren. So while salt preserve, while salt season and flavor, while we need to offer up sacrifice with salt, there is another side to salt. And, we, and this is why we, we are saying we must be careful that we spread the whole gospel. We are going to talk about the love of God, talk about the love of God, let men know. But at the same time, talk about the judgment of God and let men know that if they don't turn to God, there is going to be judgment. The salt does that. 
salt has a part, as a part of its property, judgment. So declare love, but declare judgment. Declare a God of love, but declare a God of destruction. It is very important. Declare the sweet heart of God, but declare that he is a consuming fire. And we must see that for ourselves, and we must let the world know that it is extremely important. And then, finally, Jesus himself, referring to judgment, and he uses salt, Mark chapter 9 and verse 49. And you are going to have to follow up with this. You are going to have to follow up with this immediately as we are through. So we, we, we didn't read those scriptures. So you just read that for yourself, St. Mark chapter 9. And we see Jesus himself talking about salt, amen, and, and destruction. So we are seeing some things about salt that we, we, we just did not know before for some of us. And it is important that we understand these properties because Jesus used salt to illustrate who we are. And we cannot say, God, I didn't know if I had only known. So we're taking the time out now and just go through so that we can appreciate the properties of salt and see what is supposed to be a part of our walk with God. Now, apart from pres preserving, apart from seasoning, apart from sacrificing, apart from what we just made mention of in terms of judgment and destruction, salt, depending on how it is applied, can be used, is used in fertilizers and therefore Salt can be a fertilizer. And Jesus used salt to indicate properties that we must have. So the disciples are supposed to be fertilizers. As true children of God, we are to be in those places where conditions are challenging and life is difficult, our life is hard, so that we can, like fertilizers, enrich the soil. Kill the weed, stimulate growth. You see, we are here to spread out. We are here to go into all the nations, as Jesus has said, go into all the world and preach this gospel. When we have fertilizers, we spread it across the length and breadth of the land that we are going to be farming so that it works into the soil and does what it has to do to enrich it. Uh, weeds that are there, we have to pull out. We know that when we are working as fertilizers in this world, lands that were barren must become fruitful. Yes, man, when we are spread out and the, 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 the fertilizing characteristics start being demonstrated in the soil of this world, then we can Guarantee that as we spread out and fertilize the place, life is going to spring up in unexpected places. Lands that were barren before, lands where uh, things, crops would never grow, or if they grow to a point, the fruits never come out, or if they come out, they come out halfway and then they dry up before the time. That land needs to be properly fertilized. And, and fertilizers don't have to be... Um, what we call man-made fertilizers. Fertilizers can literally be uh, done from animals, but if it is sprinkled with salt, salt mixed with these things have a property that makes it enrich the soil and stimulate growth. And Jesus was saying, you are salt. So we must understand that a part of the property of salt is to fertilize barren lands so that it can become fruitful. There are places in this world, if they hear this gospel, if they hear this message, if we reach over there and fertilize those soils, we would be surprised that there are places where people who never hear this, when they hear it, all of a sudden things start to happen. People become saved. People start to live a certain way. And it is all because we entered into that space and became the salt of the earth. It is important, children of God, that we understand this principle and that we 
allow our lives to be governed in this way. If we don't know who we are and what we are supposed to do, that is why so many times we go about in a lackadaisical way. We don't understand that Jesus said, you are the ones that I'm putting into this world, the salt of the earth, so that you can fertilize it, so that you can preserve it, so that you can... Uh, flavor it or season it so that you can, they can know that it is going to be barren and judgment is going to come and destruction is going to take place. Salt allow for all of these things to happen and we need to know this and know who we are. If we don't know who we are, if we don't know what we are about, if we don't know what we are into and what we are called to do, like so many who say they are Christians, they are going up and down and just say, I go to church every Sunday, or I tune into this, <coughs> sorry, or I tune into that. No, 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 no. The true child of God, if we ever understand who we are and what we are supposed to be and the things that we are supposed to be accomplishing, I want us to know that it will make a massive difference in how we live our lives and it is extremely 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 important so indeed we are salt but there is a point that i want to come to and it is important and 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 this is i i love to talk about these things but i always have to reference it to our lives and reference it to our christianity and reference it to our walk mark you everything that we do impacts our life and if it don't impact our Christian walk then it might not even be too much worse the while but it is important that we understand something Jesus said something that is very significant and it came out in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 5 that we read at the opening Jesus made it known that it was possible for men to lose their flavor, or for the salt to lose its saltness. Now that is frightening. Because if, if he said that we are the salt, and he has placed us out there as salt, it means we are supposed to be doing the things that salt do. We are supposed to be preserving and all the things that we have said before. If we find, beloved, that we are not flavoring the earth, if we find, beloved, that our input is not helping to preserve, it is not helping to do any of the things that we would have seen salt is supposed to do, it means that something is wrong with our salt. And like the old time people used to say, we don't work our salt. And we have to be very careful. So all that I've said is coming to critical points now, you know, because we must understand that we can lose our flavor. Yes, we can lose our saltness. And Jesus said, if we lose our saltness, we are good for nothing. And in fact, it is only good to be trampled on by the feet of men. You know, so if we lose our salt, we're not going to be of any benefit to anybody. And the fact that Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, then he wants us to impact other people. It is not about us. I'm going to make this statement. A lot of God's people believe that once they have repented and they are, and they are saved, that's it. Or once they have repented and they are saved and you know, have gone through the salvation process and they are now moving to live a holy life, that's it. Those are, that, in fact, that is crucial. But you see, our everyday walk, you see that walk of holiness is one thing and powerful and very good. But you see that walk where we must impact people. So this, no, the walk of holiness is personal holiness, which is good. But you see the walk where we are supposed to be the salt and we are supposed to be impacting lives. And we are supposed to allow others to see us. We're coming to that part, you know, the, the light of the world, where people must see us and can read from what they see and know that there is something more. We better be careful. So, but let us get back and stick to salt. If we have lost our saltness, if the salt has lost its savor, there is a problem. 
we are of no use. We are of no benefit to others. And Matthew 5 and 13, he was saying it is just deserving of being thrown out and being trampled under the feet of men. And that is very, very, very serious. It is important, brethren, that all the studies that we do, all the things that we grasp, see what we can extract from it so that we become better Christians. In this case, check our salt. See if we are impacting the world. See if we are the ones flavoring the world. I say that in order to say it is possible for the world to flavor us, in which case it is saying that we have lost our saltness. The salt has lost its savor. It has lost its flavor. It has, it has lost its ability to preserve. Yes. And if that is the case, it has lost its ability to fertilize. And if that is the case, we are in trouble. So I want us to take the time out and go through to make sure that we are salted. And as Christians, you know, we, it is important that we live our lives as pure as possible. Yes? And maximize our ability to flavor. That's what Jesus said we are. Salt. So we must flavor. We must season. We must preserve. We must fertilize. It is important. And we, we must be careful that as children of God, we don't allow. Because how we start to lose our saltness, beloved, is when we start to embrace a lot of false doctrines and sayings of men that don't go like that. We have to be very careful that we don't allow worldliness to creep into our very lives and existence. We have to be careful. You see, false doctrine and worldliness, it causes us to lose our purity and hence our ability to be salt. Careful of the things that we entertain. Careful of the things that we find our heart longing for and running after. Careful of the things out there that will impact our purity, impact our walk with God, impact the time that we spend with God. It's easy. It's a thin line, beloved. And many of us know that it's a thin line. So it is important that we never lose sight of the fact that Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. It means I am depending on you to flavor this world. I am depending on you to preserve this world from the decay and the decadence. And when I say the world, I'm talking about the people now who make up this world that needs to be preserved so that they can have time to give their lives to Almighty God. It's very important. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men, doctrines of men, doctrines that elevate and big up worldliness and world system. We have to be careful. Those things cause us to lose our saltness, to lose our ability to season and flavor. And Jesus said, if that happened, we are good for nothing. We do have no use. He has no use for us. His use for us is to understand that we are to be like salt. And, and notice, and I said it at the outset, Jesus loved using everyday items to communicate deep truths about God and his people. And so <coughs> He used terms that we are familiar with right across the globe, terms that he can pick out, and all of us will understand what they mean. Yes? So that is what he does. So he knows that we all know what salt does. He knows that we all know, in any culture, we know what salt is able to do, is capable of doing. And he takes that and uses it as a metaphor to say, you, my disciples, are the salt of the earth. 
So many of us have never seen it like that. We have only seen it to say, oh, Jesus said we are the salt of the earth, so we are the people that must just go out there and, and we just see it as simply that. No, you have to know everything that salt does or as much as possible that we can pull from what salt is supposed to do. And if salt is supposed to flavor, Jesus is saying you are supposed to flavor and season. And if salt is supposed to preserve, you are supposed to preserve. And if salt is supposed to, to fertilize, you are supposed to fertilize. When we see we're not doing anything that salt is supposed to do, watch out. The feet of men are coming to trample us underfoot. If you are salt, be salt. And be Produce what salt is supposed to produce. Or else, the tramplers are coming. And Jesus said it. And that is very, very, very significant. Very significant. Let your speech, and we, we had quoted this earlier and we didn't read it. But Paul, in talking to the true child of God, the true children of God, Paul was saying in, Colossians 4 and verse 6, let your speech, let your conversation always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer one another. In other words, Paul was saying, following up on what Jesus was saying, you know, Paul was saying that, listen to me, let your speech, let your mannerism, let your conversation, your way of life be gracious, always seasoned with salt so that you may know how. So Paul was saying, as children of God, even how you conduct yourself with each other, even the way that you talk and respond to each other, how you relate, how we relate to each other, how we relate to the world, our, our way of life must always be seasoned with salt. And it can be seasoned with salt because we are salt. So he was saying, understand who you are. Understand who you are. You are. And be seasoned, be gracious. And that is critical, critical, critical. Again, if the salt have lost its saltness, how will you make it salty again? Be careful. Be careful that you don't lose your salt because we're going to have a problem. Have salt in yourselves, it, the scripture closes off, and be at peace with one another. And I, I close with this section with this scripture in Luke 14. And the last part, whoso hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Salt is good, of course. But if the salt has lost its taste, has lost its savor, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use, either for the salt or for the manure pile, which is the fertilizer. It is thrown away. And then the final part, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. And that is a significant, significant way in which to close that verse. If you have ears, ears, to hear, hear. We are salt. That is how Jesus describes us. He used salt as an illustration to let us know who we are. Listen to what he's saying. Apply our hearts to wisdom and be salt. Be salt. It is extremely important. So that we now move to light. So in verse 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But in verse 14, and this is of St. Matthew chapter 5, that is how we started. He's now saying, you are the light of the world. Now Jesus, and I should have, I should have actually gone through this in terms of metaphor, because I've used it twice. I should have actually given a little definition of it. And so Jesus is explaining the metaphor of a believer as light. And of course, he does this to bring out a point in a clear and distinct manner. And that's something that I want us to know. He many times does that. He uses metaphors uh, 
as illustrations so that we can understand the deep things that he's saying. Sometimes if he talks a certain way, um, different across culture, we might not understand. So he gets into something that, as in this case, across culture, we know that everybody use salt, everybody need light. So he uses these things so that we can understand the depth of what he's saying, what he's trying to bring across. He wants us to understand him. It is important that we understand him. And so he demonstrates these things and uses meta metaphors to bring them across to us. The question is, what is a metaphor? A metaphor is a figure of speech in which a word or a phrase is used representing one kind of object in place of another to suggest a likeness between them. So it's kind of long. So look at it again. Let me just read it. And then I use the example to bring it across to us. So a metaphor, and I just um, pull this from the dictionary. A metaphor is a figure of speech in which a word like salt or a phrase like light of the world is representing one kind of object or idea is used in place of another to suggest a likeness between them. Let me use an example here. He is drowning in money. We have, have we ever heard the term before? What it is really saying is that the person have so much money that it is engulfing them or drowning them. In other words, drowning is a term associated with water. But they are using drowning and money together here to make the point that in the same way how somebody would drown in water because the water has overwhelmed them, the water has covered them. That means there is so much water. You wouldn't, a man, you wouldn't describe a man as drowning in his bathtub, although water is in the bathtub. Generally, that is not applicable. You wouldn't say a man is drowning in his, brushing his teeth and over his face basin in drown, no. But a man go to the beach and go out too deep and drown, the water overwhelm him, the water cover him. So in that way, we understand that the man drowned in a pool of water, in a sea of water, in a river filled with water, and it, it, it overwhelmed him, and he drowned. A metaphor so that we can understand that a man have a whole heap of money, it says he is drowning in money. So we use a phrase representing one kind of object, in this case is money, that replaces water. He is drowning in money. So we understand now that this man has so much money that it is drowning him. So he doesn't literally drown. But the, 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 the idea is to use a metaphor so we can understand that the man is overflowing overwhelmed of a whole lot of money around him. Enough that using the term drowning means that, it, like, as the man will go in a deep sea and drown, this man is in a deep reservoir of money and is filled with it. In this, similarly, my mother has a heart of gold. Of course, my mother's heart is just like mine, or your mother's heart is just like yours. It is a tissue that beats as blood goes in and blood flows out. But the metaphor is we know that gold is valuable. We know that gold is extremely rare and valuable. And so my mother has a rare and valuable heart. She has something about her that is just so precious. We know gold is a precious metal. So a mother who has a heart of gold is simply a term, a metaphor, using gold and heart to say that my mother has a precious, she's such a precious-hearted person. She's beautiful. Our brother Denico is a night owl. We know that the brother is not an owl. But a night owl mean, is a term used to 
refer to somebody that stays up all night to study, in this case, or to pray. All right? So it is pretty much what a metaphor is. So Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You're not salt. You're a human being. But he uses it to explain that what salt does, you, the human being, who is now a disciple of Jesus, who is now a true child of God, must manifest the characteristics of salt and do the things that salt do in the space that you are in. Whereas salt goes in the earth, you are in the world where people are, and you must impact the world in a way that will cause them, when they are converted, to serve the living God. And that is what he is, Jesus was you know, referring to when he referred to us as salt and light. So now we are finished with salt and we are looking at light. He said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set up on a hill cannot be hid. Light is what enables you to see, enables us to see and to make vision possible, bring things to visibility. Light illuminates, it exposes, it guides, it, it directs. The opposite of light is darkness, which speaks of you know, shadows and confusion and gloom and death and, and obscurity. But you are the light of the world. Once we, as disciples of Jesus Christ, once we, as the true children of God, move out into the world, we are supposed to be impacting this world in a very clear and deliberate way. We know that we are not bulbs, so that there is something about us that is supposed to reach out so that others can see and know that there is something different about us. Very important. Now, it is important that we understand why being the light of the world is important. But even before we, we, we look at why Jesus said we are the light of the world and what we are supposed to be doing, I want us to understand this very important point. You realize that Jesus, when he was on the Mount of Olives, preaching the Sermon on the Mount and outlining the Beatitudes, do, I, I, I wonder if we realize that this is at the start of his ministry. He was just at the outset of his ministry, yes? And he went onto that mount and he started to teach these things. And it is here, remember now, a lot of the things that they learned from him, they learned as the years went by, because he was three and a half years out in the ministry, teaching and going through with them and letting them know the scriptures and opening up as to who he was and so forth. Three and a half years. And it is at the outset at the start, near the beginning of his ministry, that he decided that he was going to let them understand who they were. Salt of the earth and the light of the world. Why is this so important? Notice, it ha they did not know a whole lot as yet. So it had nothing to do with the knowledge that they have. It had nothing to do with the teachings that they had received. And they were now going to have to start it. It had nothing to do with that because they just started. Yes? So it, it was not an account of what they knew because they had just started. This was the beginning of his ministry, beginning point of his ministry. So he hadn't taught them a lot yet. Their knowledge of what he was going to do and his messiahship, and they were just getting into it now. This is the start of the ministry. This is where Jesus was going to move with them. So they did not have a lot of knowledge. And yet still, without the knowledge, he said to them, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So it is saying to us, we are pulling this out now. 
it was not an account of what they knew, but it was an account of who they knew. Because he's telling them that you're the salt and you're the light. They don't know nothing. And he's telling them that you are going to have to understand what salt is. And how, so it is the fact that they knew him, one, and not knowledge that they would have gathered because they gathered nothing up to this point. That's one point. But the second point is this. It is not the knowledge that is so important, but their character that made them the light of the world. So they didn't have much knowledge yet, but they had been with Jesus, even for the short time. And others, later on we hear folks saying, they took note of them, that they had been with Jesus. They portray the same kind of characteristics in terms of how he conducted himself, etc., etc., etc. And people could know that they had been with him simply because of how they walked and operated and carried themselves. So we are seeing that it was at the start of his ministry he told the folks that they were salt and they were light at a time when they did not have much knowledge but he knew that they had character. So that if we are going to be the light of the world, let us, since we are talking about light now, then we are going to have to know that what is crucial is who we are inside. It's not the knowledge that we have, but it's who we are. That's what's going to make you and I the light of the world. That's what made them the light of the world. Before they built up their knowledge of all the different things, they had a certain character, and he was putting it into them. Blessed and happy are you, the, 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 the pure in heart, and blessed and happy are you, and fortunate are you, that are meek, blessed and happy are you. And he went on and went on. So these are things that speak to character, pure in heart, the meek, the peacemakers, the merciful. These are character-related matters. And to these people, he said, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Didn't have much knowledge, but the character was build, being built in them. And that is very important. That is significant. So as the light of the world, and I said this earlier on, our job description is not to just maintain personal holiness. That is crucial. But we are also to touch the lives of those around us. And in touching the lives of those around us, anybody around us, that if they are in darkness, they are able, once light comes into that dark place, once they are there and the light comes in, they will see the light. So Jesus was saying there are some things about us, something about us, as his disciples, as true children of God. There is something about us that when we go into a space, there is a noticeable difference. And people will see that difference. And that's why I'm saying if you're a child of God, you know, if you are a child of God, if I am a child of God, and we are into some spaces and people cannot see a difference, People cannot see something different about you. You're mixed into the crowd. And nobody knows who you are. Something is not right with that. We are supposed to have an aura by virtue of our poise, by virtue of our deportment, by virtue of our speech, by virtue of our mannerism. These are the things, something about us is supposed to cause people who are in darkness to see you and know that you are different. That is the light. It's not a light bulb that we put on our head and walk around with. No, it is something about our lives that make us the light of the world. And Jesus was saying, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work deeds so that there is something that we do it is things that we do 
that make people see. So remember, so they see. You, it's not you go tell them that I am a Christian or I am a disciple of Jesus. Nope. That's not seeing, that is hearing. Jesus was saying, you ought to do something for them to see. And that is the significant point that we just cannot afford to miss. So the light is not necessarily in the weakness of our words, but it is in the weakness of our deeds. And that is significant. We must not so lose sight of that. Now, what does light accomplish? Light gives direction. Light gives meaning. Light reveals the true nature of things. Yes? And we, we, we must never lose sight of that. It gives direction. Number one. So if we are talking about light gives direction, if you are going down the road and there's a power cut going down the road one night, nine o'clock in the night and you're on your way home and all of a sudden uh, a vehicle runs into a post and the light goes out in the area and everywhere becomes, it's not one of those nights when the moon is bright and so forth and the place is dark, you're going to have a problem. You're not even going to know if, because light is gone, so you're not depending on street light now. The light in the houses are gone, so you have nothing to give illumination so that, <coughs> sorry, so that you can know where to turn and left and then right and then continue down and take the last left to get to your house. Or if it's not your house, but somebody else's place you were going, once the lights are out, you are lost. So we see that light gives direction. Once there is light and you're going to a particular place, I mean, once if you're walking, uh, we're not talking about using GPS now, and, and even with your GPS, it's going to say take the second right or the next right. If the light is not there, uh, well, you, you will have light on your car. So we're not talking about GPS. But you walk to get to a place and the lights go. Or just be, you're studying or doing something in your room and the lights go. There is no direction. In your own house, if the light go, and you don't have a lamp or, or a flashlight, you're walking and you're feeling and you're going to hit over something in your own house that you know. So I want us to understand that light gives direction. It is in the same way that as children of God, we are in the world. We are supposed to illuminate the place that people can say, but if, if I am tired of what I am doing, I am tired of where I am. I want to be like Sister Angela. I want to be like Brother Johnson. What is actually happening there is your life is giving direction. Sometimes they are not even sure of where they are going, but your light is like a beacon. Your light is like a your life is like a beacon. Your life is like a lighthouse. They just see something different, peculiar about you, and that makes the world of a difference to them. And so light gives direction. Uh, light gives meaning. You know, somebody can have a watch that was given to them, uh, a Rolex watch. And I say given to them because most of us won't go buy a Rolex. You know, you have Rolex that can cost 250,000 US dollars. We're not going to buy it, right? Uh, we're not going to buy it. We're going to put it down. We're going to probably carry it in a safety deposit box and put it at the bank because 250,000 US, if I get a watch like that, is at the bank, I'm going to keep it in a vault because it's money. It's not a watch. But let's say it's a watch. And for some reason, it is at our house. If the light goes, if we're feeling around, we, and let us say the watch is of gold, can you, can you, let us say it's a golden Rolex watch. Very valuable. But if the light is gone, do we know, do you know that even if we go around and feel and find that this is a watch over here, it's just a watch. If there is not light around shining on that thing, the gold is not going to glitter. If there is not light shining on it, 
and we see the face to know that it's a Rolex watch. We are not going to understand the value of the thing. It's just a watch on a shelf. And worse if we have a couple of watches in the house, and we're going through the darkness, and we're feeling around, and we and buck up on a watch. As far as we're concerned, it's just a watch we buck up on here. So if we go over into the other room, and we're feeling around, it's just a watch we buck up on. And we hold it, and we try to put it back down. But when the light comes back, and we look, I say, oh my God, it's the golden Rolex watch. And we quick take it up and try to find a draw to put it. The light coming gives meaning to what we are looking at. We are seeing that it is a watch, a Rolex watch, and it is a watch that is golden. If it wasn't for the light, we wouldn't see the gold. And if it wasn't for the light, we wouldn't realize that it is the Rolex watch. And that's why I'm saying now, light gives meaning to things. It gives, in our case, it gives meaning to lives. Because people are going to see us and what they see of us and they desire to be like us. They are going to realize that there is still meaning to life. It is your light that is shining forward. It reveals the true nature of things. The light makes us see is, is, the, the watch is out of gold. The light makes us to see that it is Rolex. The, the light makes us to see that all of these things are what they are supposed to be. And so, beloved, it is important that we recognize that these things are so. Light is important. Light illuminates. Light gives visibility. Light makes us see, reveal the value of things. Light makes us to understand that yes, see the Rolex, see the Ro golden Rolex, as opposed to feeling and just picking up a watch and say, oh, this looks like a watch, and we put it down back and boxing around, trying to find our way to a chair to sit down. Light, the entrance of light allows us a lot of things. And I'm saying to us, brethren beloved, I am saying to us, True children of God. This is the reason why I titled this study series, The True Child of God. Because many folks, and we are in a society, and I want us to be very clear on this. I want us to be very cautious, but to be very clear. It is not everybody that says, I am a Christian. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ is a disciple of Jesus Christ. It is not everybody. It is not everyone that walks around with a Bible and say, I belong to Jesus, that really belong to Jesus. Even in the apostolic church, it is not everybody that embraces and declares that I got saved 20 years ago and I am now, after 20 years, a stalwart in the house because I've been there, done that. Are you salt? Are you light? Are you living up? Are we living up to the description, to the illustration that Jesus used to say who we are? In other words, what we are supposed to be doing and accomplishing as real disciples, as true children of God? Are we salting the earth? Are we lighting the world? Because if not, Jesus said where the salt is concerned, you're going to be trampled if you have lost your saltness. And by virtue of, of him saying that, it means that it is possible. Be careful that you have not lost your saltness, but we're still running up and down and carrying on. And we can't flavor nothing. We can't season nothing. We can't fertilize nothing. We can't preserve nothing. But we're making pure noise. Be very careful. Light is supposed to illuminate, show the true value of things. Be careful if your life, 
Because when he says you are the light, he's saying that you are supposed to be radiating from you. Something is supposed to be shining forth that people can look at you and know that you have been with Christ. Or you are different. And you are a child of God. If nothing is emanating from you, if nothing is radiating from you or I as a child of God, it means we are not true lights. And that is significant because he said it is a crazy thing for you to light up something and then use something and cover it. Many folks are covering the light because we've, we genuinely might have received this salvation. We genuinely had an experience with God, repented of our sins, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. Genuine experience. But as we live that personal holy life, how are we impacting the peoples of this world? How are we troubling them? How are we playing the role of being a transformative agent? How are we playing the role of being salt and light? And that is very significant. And Satan knows this, and we're going to come to that as we probably won't get to that today, but next week as we finish up on this series. Satan knows. And so what he does, he does everything for us to lose our saltness. He does everything for our lights to be dim. And so we are not radiating. We are not sending out. We are not illuminating. People are not seeing nothing in us. And Satan has some things that he does to dim our lights and to pull away the flavoring of our solids. He has, and we want to come to it. And he is deliberate in how he does his thing because he knows that if the salt has lost its saltness, it is good for nothing. He knows. And he knows that many of us might be here but good for nothing because we have lost our saltness. And we just, just introspect and see what we're doing. See if we are doing what salt is supposed to do. Just introspect. See what we are doing. And see if we are radiating as light is supposed to radiate. And we will know if we are the true disciples, the true children of God. So let's go back to this slide and continue on light. So we are on the subject area of light. And we want to be very clear. We want all of us to be abundantly clear that we are supposed to be radiating because we are light and light illuminates cause visibility we are able to determine things because once the light is there the darkness runs away and so let us continue on light so we are on the slide that where we made a note that we are sent to give meaning to the lives of men. Just a while ago, I indicated that light gives meaning to the watch. Without the light, it is just a watch. But when the light is there and we see, we can say, oh my God, this is the Rolex, and this is a golden Rolex at that. It gives meaning to the object. In our case, we are sent to give meaning to the lives of men. Yes, light brings beauty and color. Light brings beauty and color. And that is extremely, extremely important. It brings beauty and color. And we, we, we bring beauty, yes, to the lives of men in this world. Once we radiate our light, we are, men are seeing us, and we are able to cause men to know that life for them can be beautiful. Not in the secular sense, but of course we know in what sense once they come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because once you have that experience with the Lord, and once you have that relationship strong and going, it does not matter what is happening in the world around us. There is beauty. We can see dark clouds and hurricanes coming in the natural, and yet there is beauty and color and joy to life because something 
is happening on the inside that we would have caused to happen because men were able to look at us and see something different about us and come to know the Almighty because of us. When last is there anybody that can say that you know about? Maybe you don't know because it can happen that you don't even know. But is your life shining to the extent that people can see you and say, this is a child of God? Or is it that when they look at you, you're going to have to tell them that you go to church? Because this is where a lot of Christians are in trouble with the word because they don't understand the depth of what Jesus is talking about. When he talks about light, you know, folks are supposed to be able to look at you and your conduct and your mannerism and everything about you, the total you, how you deal with business and deal. They are supposed to look and know that there is something different about you and that you are, in other words, they're seeing something emanating from you that caused them to know and to say the seat, how you conduct yourself, how you live, how you walk, how you talk, how you operate at work, how it's just different. That is light shining to them. And that is exactly what we are supposed to do to bring sweetness to the lives of men. And that is extremely important. Uh, a question is asked, have we lost our influence over the community? over with our next door neighbor? Is it that they are looking at us and saying, but you may not see nothing. You never even know, say, he was a Christian. I alluded to it a while ago. If we neglect our responsibility to be what God called us to be, the community will ignore us. They will see us as just another part of their space. I'm telling you, when we are true representatives when we are true children of God, when we are true disciples of Jesus, light and salt, as Jesus declared in St. Matthew 5, when we are true representatives, people will see and people will listen to us. And I am telling us that it is as simple as that. We are not expected to hide our lights under a basket. We are not expected to go around a corner. Some folks are in church, they're clapping and shouting, but on the ro road, they're hiding their lights under a basket. And Jesus specifically spoke to this, and he said, it is wrong. Something is wrong if you're, it, it don't go together. Why would anybody see night come and turn on the light? Light the lamp because they didn't even have electric light then. Light the lamp, and then take a big basket and cover it. So you light it so you can see, and then you cover it. Nobody can see, and everybody hitting up into each other. Something is wrong with that narrative, and that is what Jesus is saying. How you light? Why light the lamp and then cover it up? Something not wrong with that. And yet that is where some of us are at this point. That is where many of God's children are at this point. They have they have come into the house of God. They have surrendered their lives. They have pretty much done what they have to do. And now they are hiding. They don't want anybody to know that they are Christians. They don't want anybody to know that they are Christians. And somewhere, somehow, in the midst of all of their living, they are going to church, coming to church, doing the things that they're asked to do in the house of God, uh, singing and rejoicing. I, I want to take the time out, brethren beloved. We're going to stop here. I want to take the time out for us to understand that it is much more than singing and shouting. It is much more than just turning up at church. It is much more than just going on the track distribution. The thing has to be personal, and we have to understand who we are. What we have looked at have shown, have shown that we have to demonstrate the qualities of salt and the qualities of light, because he, and, and Jesus specifically 
Use that metaphor so we can understand. We can't say we never understand. He used it so that we can understand. And we have broken it down to show you what salt does, its characteristics, and the things that it can do. What light does in terms of its illuminating capability, it causes visibility. We must demonstrate in our lives that we are the children of God, the true children of God. Not just any child of God or anybody saying, I'm a child of God. Everybody says that now. But Jesus said, your salt have lost its saltness, trouble. If you light your candle or if you light whatever it is that you have, your lamp, and then go and cover it, it makes no sense. And he's saying, you are salt. Do the things that salt do. You are light. Do the things that light is supposed to do. Because this is what demonstrates who the real Christians are. The real disciples are. And if we are not seasoning and flavoring, we are not preserving, if we are not fertilizing, if we are not showing that judgment is coming, and all the things that salt is supposed to do. And if, we are, if our lights are not shining, and nobody can look at us and know that we are children of God, something is wrong. Maybe we are no longer children of God. It is that serious. It is that serious. And I'm telling you, none of us must miss kingdom for anything. I want to know, and I want all of us to know. We are in this thing together because we all want to go to the same place. And so we must know and understand, grasp the thing. And as I close, we pick up next week, God's willing. In fact, I won't even get into that. I was going to say something, but I'll leave it for next week because we're going to close. But more than anything else, I want us to examine ourselves and see if our saltness is still there. See if we are impacting the earth, because you are the salt of the earth. Check our light. See if we are still illuminating, because we are supposed to light the world. Light the world means once we step into a space, people will be there who sense a difference. It's not what they hear, because some people will never read a Bible outside of the life that they see you and I live. And that's why we must shine, because it's that that is going to illuminate them, that they will see something in us that said, this man or this woman is different. Brethren, beloved, let your light shine. Brethren, beloved, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Season this place. Let your light shine and be the true child of God that you are called to be. God bless you. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for another Wednesday night Bible study. We thank you, God, for allowing us to understand again who we really are, what we are supposed to be doing, how we are as individual children of God, how we are supposed to be impacting this world. I pray that you will help us to be true salt and to be true light so that we can impact the community around us. We can impact the spaces around us and demonstrate that we are indeed children of God and we serve a great, big, wonderful God. Have your own way. Let us get into this word and let this word get into us. We will give you glory, we will give you honor, we will give you praise. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. God bless you. Looking forward to seeing us in church again on Sunday. And what a great time we're going to be having, amen, in the presence of the Lord as we get together Sunday morning, amen, for a time of worship and praise. God bless you, in Jesus' name.
praise God.